everybody, and welcome to another edition of Average Superstar TV. I am your host, Lauren Lepery. Please hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. And this week, we are back in uh, actually the television world. I am very happy to have this guest. This is some uh, definitely a series for my fandom. Everybody's definitely going to know. But this guy is obviously most known for the great classic television series, The Monsters. He played the role of Eddie Monster. He's been around a long time. You could catch him on the convention circuit. He's also been in movies like Dickie Roberts. With that, I welcome Butch Patrick. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Lauren. It's funny. I'm I'm listening to Average Superstar. It's kind of like Jumbo Shrimp. Is that like an oxymoron? <laughs> well, yeah. To be honest with you, what it happens where I came up with that name is I'm a person. I was in the wrestling business. I was in the music business, and now I'm in the film business. So I kind of get to hang out with some cool people and I have a lot of amazing stories. However, on Monday morning, I report to a full-time job. So I feel I have superstar life as well as an average nine to five. So I combined it that name. Gotcha. Yes. So, but Butch, um, really, I'd love to hit the rewind button here. Um, when you go back to the Munsters era, I'm just curious. Everybody asks you about this all the time. My question for you to start off is, it's 1966. This is kind of curious, between two or three networks, like, what's that era like compared to now? What's going on then? Well, you know, uh, it was a lot of people consider the 50s as the golden age of television, which, you know, it, it, it was somewhat. But really, television, the sitcom came into its own in the early 60s. And up to that point, sitcoms were basically visual radio shows that had been shot on uh, very much like a state, like, like the Jack Betty program and things of that nature. They transferred when the technology came into television, they were still structured very much like radio. But in the early sixties, the sitcom um, took root and comedy writers that were then supplying jokes and everything for radio had a visual, um, had a visual platform of which to write scripts and it became much more creative and, 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 and wide open for almost anything. I mean, you had talking horses, you had Martians, genies, witches, monsters, and talking cars like my mother, the car. So from a comedy standpoint, the sky was the limit. And it just so happened it connected very well with a lot of great comedians from the fifties moved into television and you had your, Phil Silvers and you had your, you know, the Fred Gwynn and the Al Lewis and the Jack Benny and, you know, a lot of, a lot of talent was around. Let's put it that way. Got you. So it, this got to carry, you're about what, what age when this started? I, well, I, I was seven years old when I started acting in 1960, I'm 69 years old. So I had a very good window for 14 years of music, TV, movies. It was a really good time in the entertainment industry. So just out of curiosity, like, was did, did you just get bit with the acting bug and you told your family, or I like I just I'm just more curious because there was only so much work with the network. I mean, we're talking a time where around 11, 12 at night, everything went static. Like there wasn't enough programming. So was it like you're in, or is your parents like, hey, you know, there's auditions over here. Do you want to go check this out? Like, how did it all start? Well, it, it started with my little sister being looked at to do some print modeling. She was very cute and had this incredible head of hair. And a girlfriend of hers knew an agent that was starting up the, the world's first uh, exclusive child agency. And her name was Mary Grady. And for that, and we, she made an appointment to go have some pictures taken with a gentleman named Amos Carr. And Amos Carr had a studio on Hollywood Boulevard. And he was the go-to child star photographer, as well as other stuff. But he was definitely the, the best photographer for getting the best poses for kids. And after he was done with my sister, he asked my mom for permission. May I take a couple pictures of your son? He's got a very interesting look. And he put this silly hat on me. And I, I, took, I made this pose like with my hands like this and a goofy face. And he put it in the, uh, the window of his, um, um, his, his photography a studio on Hollywood Boulevard. And about a month later, a producer and a director were happened to be walking by and they were still looking for the youngest son of a movie they were doing that starred Eddie Albert and Jane Wyatt, Brenda Lee and Super Sales. They liked my look. They found out how to get in touch with me through Amos Carr and they tracked me down and I went up for an interview. And 
Uh, they said, would you, you know, would you like the job? You got to start sometime. And I asked my mom, I go, you know, what's, what's, what are the perks that you can, well, you'll get paid and you won't have to go back to second grade for a while. And I go, let's do it. <laughs> and, that was, and then while that movie was being done in that six week window, I picked up a Kellogg's Corn Flakes commercial that won some awards and, uh, and, a, and a few other roles as well. So it kind of was just accidentally haphazard. And I was just a kid that wasn't intimidated by adults and could handle uh, memorizing lines. That's wonderful. So when it comes to, I know like there's a bunch of child labor laws in Hollywood and stuff now, like how was the workload and like, did you understand like what, like the importance of the TV? Like, like you can't really get tired and all that. I mean, what were the hours like? Did they, did they try to get you in, get your scenes done and get you cut and let the adults handle it? Or is it just constant? It's it's still the the rules are still the same. You have the only thing for the monsters there was a difference was there was an hour of makeup added into that nine hour window that you were allowed. So um, the you have three hours of school, you have one hour of lunch, and you have one hour of recreation. So that's five hours a day that is mandatory yours to do with as you please. But you got to get the three hours of school in, the lunch, and the extra hour. So after that five hours, you have basically four hours left. Uh, um, uh, three or four, I can't remember if it was nine hours or eight hours, but that those were leftover hours are when you can work. Now, in the summertime is when they would load you up with a lot of work because when you get, when the rest of the country goes to summer vacation, so do you. So those three hours of school are removed from the table and the studio can then use those extra three hours. So now you have seven hours of film time versus four. And that's whenever you see a kid working at like a lot in a, in a, in a segment, you know that it's a summer shoot because that extra three hours adds a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, extra screen time to the kids uh, workload. Got you. And just kind of curious, cause it's a whole different era. Like I would definitely say back then with limited amount of networks, people, you know, you only have so many TV shows to watch. So, being your age, being so young, I mean, were you constantly noticed in public or or did the makeup kind of hide you a little bit that you some people had to do a double take to notice you? Um, well, the, the people, you know, if I was walking around, no, they wouldn't notice me. It was I was lucky in that respect and I liked it that way. Um, but occasionally I would wear the makeup home or I would leave the studio in the afternoon to go to uh, go to my hobby shop or go see George Barris. And then it would be fun to see people's reactions. But um no, I was uh, uh, the the Eddie Munster makeup um, was was good in, in respect that it, it people like to say, well, did you get typecast? I go, well, the term typecast means you would look like that on all the rest of your endeavors, and that's not the case. I I was there for two years, and when the show was over, I moved on and did a lot of other stuff. I moved over to Disney and um, did you know nine nine episodes of My Three Sons over three years, and I kept very busy. Um, but it was only a fourteen year run, and it was always to me it was something to do that would fund my race car project that I wanted to do when I was later. I was never a career for me. I was just a kid that had a knack for doing it, but it was never, it was never a career for me. Uh, totally understood that. I love that answer. Uh, as far as during those two years, I mean, did you, were the rest of the cast, were you guys like a, a family or were you kind of almost more work associates? No, and I'll, t I'll tell you, we were like a family, and I think that's one of the secrets of the of success of the show. It looked believable on the screen that we were a family. We acted like a family, and we functioned. And we, looked, we looked like a functioning family who happened to be, you know, in makeup as monsters. But what happened was is um, I had done a year of the Real McCoys prior to the Munsters, and my mom married a baseball player who was traded from California to Washington, D.C., to the old senators. So the whole family moved back east, and I went to live with my grandmother in Illinois. Well, when the Munsters was cast, my, they already had another kid in mind, Happy Dermot. First, they asked Bill Mooney. Bill Mooney said no. They didn't like the makeup, so he was out. Then they got Happy Dermot, and, and the pilot was shown to the networks, and they said yes on the pilot, but no to the kid and no to the mom. So they brought in Yvonne DiCarlo, and they were looking for another kid. And my agent caught wind of that, Mary Grady, and she convinced them to fly me in from Illinois to do a screen test uh, with no reading, no nothing, directly to a screen test with Yvonne DiCarlo, which I did, and they hired me. Now the problem we have was I have no family in Los Angeles because everybody's on the East Coast. So I moved in with my uncle. I mean, I had no immediate family. I had my uncle there. And I moved in with my uncle. We hired a woman to take me to work. Long story short, when you're talking about family, I actually was, that was my family for two years, more so than my real family, because 
you know, my real family was around. So it was, it was my family unit and everybody on the cast was very family friendly. Plus the producers had to leave it to Beaver for six years. So they were very kid friendly. So it was a good place to be. That's wonderful. And just, I mean, going back, it, it was such an amazing show and what, especially for them, what a creative idea of taking all those icons. We're going to make them a family <clears throat> and to me, those episodes like hold up so well. I guess my next question is like, what, why did you think it didn't have a longer, longer run? Was it just, a, is this the, the way TV was going? Two, two, one, one definite thing came into play was Batman came in and, and the ratings suffered because of Batman. But we were also in a transitional window of black and white programming going to color. During that period, that swing period, a lot of the shows you'll see at Gilligan's Island, you'll see a few shows, the Beverly Hillbillies, a lot of shows were black and white, and then they transitioned to color. Batman came in as a color show, almost a showcase show to introduce color to the world, like Disney's World of Color did. The Monsters was a better show in black and white. It was a black and white genre show like the old Universal Monster movies. Yep. I don't believe it would have done well in color. And number two, the ratings were down. There was a, a little bit of a cost who was going to pay for the color. And there were no guarantees it was going to work to win the ratings battle to make it worthwhile. But I believe, in my opinion, Fred and Al were from New York. They were New York actors. They lived in New York. They were out in L.A., transplanted. And they, I believe, between the ratings and the problems and everything else, I think they just washed their hands up and said, let's just call it a day after two years and we want to go home. But what they did do is they made the Monster Go Home movie in color. So instead of a third season, they did. They just didn't walk away. They went to the table, created a created a movie, and that movie basically introduced the rest of the world to the monsters, so that they then could sell syndication when it came out. Understood. Okay. Cool. Cool. Uh, moving right along. Uh, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, you, you were in another movie where I could literally do an entire show on just this particular part, but. Your part in Dickie Roberts, along with the reunion, uh, that is something I literally go to YouTube and I I know every word. It's just one of those, it's a pick-me-up song that keeps me in a good mood. But to start off with questions with that, did when you first heard, like when this was presented to you, did were you just like, cool, it's work, fun, it'll be a reunion? Or were you almost like, are you trying to insult us? Like, did, were you a little taken back on for a second? Like, what was your initial thoughts? That was a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. Okay. I'd go see a bunch of friends. I mean, I knew everybody, most of the people there. They're doing it. It's kind of like a, a club. It's you know, it's not like if you're if, they're, if you're being made fun of, you're being made fun of as a group. Uh -huh. you know? But mainly, mainly it was it was a paycheck. That's bottom line. And I, and I did have a chance to meet David Spade, which was a really good thing. I was a big fan of David. We actually had a chance to have lunch together. So uh, seeing all the friends, doing the thing, and uh, the movie itself was actually quite uh, quite entertaining. Yeah. Uh, uh, but as far as your part of singing the song, I mean, I met between that and, like, Maureen McCormick was – did you guys get to write your own little, like, no. if you were to lay – no, it was written for you? Yeah, it was written for me. And that, honestly, the good thing about the least – on the end, she was the first, I was the second. She was the first female, I was the first male. So I'm glad that I at least got up at the front of the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were like right out of the gate. Yeah, that was that was, that was rather off. That it's it's really is. It was just really entertaining, and uh, yeah, it, it's like I said, it's one of my go to pick me ups when 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 I need to uh, smile. So well, I'm, no, I'm no singer, but I, but I I pulled it off at least reasonably well. Yeah, yeah. So moving along, do you are now, I mean, this is where I talked to you at briefly, but um, you live a lot in the, the convention circuit, which uh, is amazing. I mean, what's your initial thoughts like for, for how long these conventions are going? And they, they go and they go and the fans are just insane. They eat it all up. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I was one of the first people when, when this whole cycle started, it coincided when I did uh, Whatever Happened to Eddie, which was a Munsters themed rock video back when MTV first came on the air, we wanted to make rock videos. We had no experience, and we decided that I wrote some lyrics to a Munsters theme. We recorded it, did the video, and we were the first unsigned act ever to be on MTV, which was quite a coup back in the day because it was all about payola. But what they did from that, us being on without a record deal, they thought that, wow, there must be a lot of other bands out there, garage bands, 
unsigned bands with a videotape that have footage that we could utilize and they formed the basement tapes from that idea. So at that time, right when we started getting the word out with Al Lewis and myself about whatever happened to Eddie, it just so happened that that was 33 years ago and comic cons were just starting, conventions were just starting. So the Munsters was a family friendly, it fit, it fit into several categories, pop culture, classic you know, TV, horror, um, merchandise, we were heavily merchandise, toys. So I kind of, we kind of got introduced to the, in the early stages and it was interesting and it was fun and you're meeting fans and they're liking meeting you and you're liking meeting them. And it gave you an outlet that I, love to, I like to travel, I like meeting people and it actually, you know, you could make a few bucks at the, at the same time. So it just kind of evolved. But when I bought my cars, my Munster cars, that allowed me a different approach to the whole thing where now I do mostly automotive related events and uh, it's a little bit of a bigger uh, event status thing. Gotcha. Well, let's stay right there. So you're, 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 you, you do the auto racing, you do auto shows, like that give, fill, fill well, us in. Automotive events, they, they, the promoters always like to have something there for people to, between races, if you're at the NHRA, between rounds, if you're at NASCAR, if you're at the Indy Racing League, they like to have celebrities, like, you know, Batman didn't, Adam West didn't have a Batmobile, and uh, John Schneider, he does things with the General Lee, and I have a Munster coach and a Bat, and, and a Dragula. So when, when people are putting on events that they draw lots of people, they like to have something there for the people to enjoy themselves, and something for photo ops, and this and that. Uh, I've done, you know, the pace, the, the been the pace car. I've done parade routes. I've done, you know, the first car down the Dream Cruise in Detroit with a hundred thousand cars. So that's the type of stuff that I'm comfortable doing and I like doing. I still do. I mean, I'll still do comic cons, but the problem is, in a comic con, you know, my two cars take up enough room for like thirty celebrities. Yeah. So you have to have the right venue, and you got to be like, you know, you got to be like. I remember I was the first guy in the Superdome. And I, I was really tripped out because I go, this is very cool. I'm right dead center looking up at the Mercedes emblem of my cars in the Superdome and imagining all the great things that have happened on this spot. But you got to be the first one in and you're the, you're the last one out. But that goes with the territory. But I, I like it because now I'm, I'm not just sitting at a table and it allows me to bring my cars and my merchandise table. And it's a much bigger package. That's that's wonderful. So speaking of draggy look, got, uh, maybe you have the info on this. How many actual cars did the movie studio have of that? Because I hear so many people say, "Oh, this celebrity owns Dragula. and I'm like, "Was it a replica or is it the actual one? One, you know? Well, the, the... well, there's only one, and the one the one that's in my car club, my club brother actually owns. Um, he had number three. Uh, and I found that number three through another friend of mine who had had it and I brokered that deal. And then he sold it when he got number one, he sold number three and number three was the one that just sold for $468,000. So supposedly there's five, but there's lots. It's a very easy build for someone that knows how, if you've got a tea bucket, you can pretty much turn it into a, into a Dragula with a coffin. I mean, it's, it's not that difficult. So you see a lot of them. I'm actually building a brand new one, but I have the last, coffin out of the original mold from 1964 so mine's going to be extremely accurate extremely fast and it's exactly like the original it'll be the fastest loudest baddest um, most accurate dragula on the planet um next to the number one that's in my club the number one in my club doesn't run it was hanging from the ceiling in atlantic city at planet hollywood so it has yet to be energized Wow. That's... He's also got number three coach, which there were three original coaches. One is in Orlando. Number two is at the Barris you know, house ha camp in, in California, uh, Barris Industries. And number three is, is with my friend John, and he's got number three. Coolness. Did you get that? I mean, outside of what you just said with the cars, did you get that? Get take any of the props home when uh, the, the show ended? Do you have anything actually from the Munster's house? Not really, but it's funny. I was out doing an Ironside about seven, year, seven years after the show ended, and the prop master, Eddie Keyes, who at the time was like 85 when he quit doing our show, was still alive, and he came up to me. I was so happy to see him, and he handed me the original Wolf Wolf doll that he had been taking care of for the last seven years, and he gave it to me, and I, and I brought that home. Awesome. Man, that's at, least, at least you got something, right? Yeah, you're, you're not thinking back then, especially being a kid, you know? That, I, 
you weren't supposed to bring home anything from the prop, you know, anything from makeup. And I would bring my my ears home and give them away. And I would bring some head, some Fred Gwynn head pieces home and give them away because I wasn't a collector and I saw the joy and brought to everybody else. And it was really easy for me just to, you know, I figured I'll get some more tomorrow. And I never really thought about it. I mean, I didn't even keep my scripts, you know? Yeah. Well, that's, I think it's just kind of like all the, uh, all us kids when we were young, all those toys are worth tons of money, but yeah. you're just throwing them away. You're left, you don't know. You don't know then. I'll give you an idea. My stepdad was, was Mickey Mantle's roommate when he was with the Angels before he oh. came to with, with the Yankees before he came to the Angels. And I had a Mickey Mantle baseball glove, Mickey Mantle, Mickey Mantle's Mickey Mantle model that my dad gave me. And I loaned it to a kid at Little League and I never got it back. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Yeah, and you know he probably just threw it away eventually because yeah. like yeah, no nobody knew nobody knew comic books no one knew baseball cards but you you didn't know yeah so as far as the the, the recent monsters do you have any comment on that I, I definitely did not check I definitely did not check that out after I saw the trailer it just kind of didn't do it for me well you know something if people in my opinion number one about ninety percent of the people that have seen it are, are liking it so that's a good thing. Number one, from a from a business standpoint, but people get so wrapped up. The, the internet is a very is a very fickle place. It's a it's a very strange place. Um, I, I have lots of thoughts on that that I sh that I don't share with people because it just it's it serves no purpose and all you do is anger people up and they just it's like people are laying in wait and they're wound this tight and they just can't wait to pounce on you for whatever. So. I and they pounce all over Rob and all over Sherry and, you know, and all over the thing, because when they either like the original monsters and they feel it's an insult to try to copy it, or they love Rob zombie, scary movies, and this isn't blood and guts. So they're looking for reasons to dislike it. And all I tell people is just leave your baggage at the door, walk into it for 149 minutes, an hour, 49, excuse me, an hour, 49 minutes and let it entertain you. And, and it, if you don't like it, you don't like it. And you get up and leave and be the end of it. But you don't have to just take out every, you know, pick it apart and be angry and have all this energy, negative energy about it. So I'm happy that most people like it because it is entertaining and it is fun to watch. And it's, and it's from a guy that really likes the monsters and he did it for the right reasons. And if it didn't turn out to be your cup of tea, you know, he wasn't doing it for the paycheck. He was doing it because he really thought that this would be an entertaining family related film that the, that the, you know, the kids are loving it. That, and when the kids love it, the parents kind of like it. But a lot of a lot of people and it's gotten good reviews from some very legitimate um, uh, um, critics. And obviously, there's a lot of people trashing it as well. But gotcha. But yeah. like Great answer. Well, do you have a particular moment on that set that uh you could share with anyone that like your favorite moment on Rob set. No, on, uh, on the monsters. Monsters. I always enjoyed Monday morning when we, when we would go into the office to read our script and find out what we were going to be doing for the week. Whenever the monster coach was utilized, I was very happy because two things occurred. Number one, there's a very good chance I would be riding in the back seat, which is like the coolest car in TV. And I would be back up there. I knew Fred enjoyed driving it. So it would be fun because he would gas it. I'd be in the back if I was in the car in the scene. But number two, it meant we'd be outside. And we spent most of our time indoors in the Munster set, which is a very dark, dingy set. So that was one of my things. And then also, when I had free time and I could see that I was not going to be used very much in that episode, I had a chance to go explore Universal back lot. And that was an incredible place for a kid to go explore. Um, whether it was my uncle supplying horses to the Virginian or Wagon Train or Laredo, or going out to see Mikhail's Navy's cast at the at the lagoon, uh, or go to the lab to go see what Mike Westmore is making. What a great place to go hang out for a kid to go explore, and I had and I and I took full advantage of it. My one question that I definitely had here was: I'm a giant Don Rickles fan, and I know he was on that uh, an episode. Yeah. Kind, of, kind of curious, did you get the? I don't I don't remember if exactly you interacted or were even in that episode, but I, wasn't, I didn't have a chance. That was that was Don Rickles and also Joyce Jameson. She was in it as well, and uh, I didn't get a chance to deal with them at all on that particular episode. I was in it very, very little. Uh, but we had plenty of other stars that I got to interact with. I, Paul Lynn, you know, with the Hedy's nickname with the with the beard and, and interacting with Paul Lynn. Um, there was there was a lot. I mean, just working with Fred and Al themselves, they were like great. Leo DeRocher, when he came on, he was actually managing the Cubs when my dad was playing for the Cubs. That was funny. Um, 
the uh, the Eddie character became a pretty strong character in the, in the cast that he he grew from just being a typical kid to where they started writing scripts that featured uh, father and son scripts because Herman always wanted to uh, never disappoint his little boy and I would volunteer him for everything. So the uh, the acting, you know, Fred taught me a lot about uh, and improved my acting ability. Al improved my worldliness about the real world around me because he was such a go getter and you know, outgoing guy. So uh, it was great for me to be around those guys. They uh, it, it was it made me a lot more well rounded and I learned quite a bit. Yes, and there's one particular episode with you where you uh, had a friend name. I think his name was Googie. Yeah, that's Bill Mooney. Oh my gosh, what what an actor! Because what did he really get under your skin? But what, what, he did he did a great job. That was like the only episode where like you, the monsters here to make you laugh. But this was a character. I'm like, wow, this kid's agitating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and Bill are still really good friends. Uh, <laughs> he was, you know, he turned down the part. It was funny that he came on. You know, and that was another thing. I, I would I would enjoy when they would write a script that featured, you know, like Peter Robbins came on as Elmer and he was the voice of Charlie Brown and. Uh, a few other kids came through occasionally, but um, yeah, it was it was uh, nice to have some some friendships of my own age once in a while. But I got along great with the adults, so it wasn't really a problem. Marvelous. Well, Butch, thanks for coming on. Uh, just as an actor or someone who's been around, definitely been around the block a few times. Uh, I would you could you just give some advice because I know I have a lot of people that are in film here for anyone sure. trying to get into the acting industry. Like, what would be the top thing you would tell them? Yeah, well, I used to actually, we toured, I toured with a woman named Julie Matthews on a, a we, our thing was called How to Get Into Show Business the Right Way, and we would do screen tests for people, and we would give them scripts of commercials or scenes from famous movies, and then they would they would do their acting, and the, the most difficult thing for me was to know that someone didn't have a chance in hell, and that, but you could see it was their dream, and how do you, how do you go about talking to this person, giving him advice? And not lying, but trying not to pop their bubble at the same time. So the advice that I always gave people, and a lot of times it was a kid with a parent there, but a lot of times it was an adult. And what I would say to them, I go, as long as you're doing it because you enjoy it and you're doing it because it gives you joy, yeah, it brings you joy and this and that, but you're not looking to get rich off it, continue to do it by all means. If you're looking to get rich off it, the chances are like getting in the NFL or baseball, you're like, not, don't count on that at all, but here's what you can do. When you next time you go see a movie, and if you're comfortable being in the industry without being the star, if, you're, if your ego is okay that you just want to be part of this magical, wonderful world of movie making and being at, on the studio and, and working that side of the street, all those names at the end of the movie, all those names you see, they all make good money, they all have benefits, they all have 401s. All those people are in the industry. You'll have a much better chance trying to find one of those titles those guys up there have and pursuing that. And if you still want to be an actor, well, at least this way you're closer to the industry that you want to get into, but you're not waiting for it you know, to make you an actor to get, you know, to pay the bills. That way you might come in from the back door. And that's what I would tell people. Do it for the joy. Don't count on getting rich. And, uh, and you might want to look at those other titles that get you onto the studio a lot as a, uh, as a, uh, you know, construction or a painter or a transportation captain. There's, there's a million people that make movies. The guy in front of the camera, the actor is like one of a thousand. Thank you for that answer. You got it. <laughs> Sweet. Well, Butch, thank you so much for coming on. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Uh, at this time, do you have any uh, plugs or Anywhere you're going to be, anyone, any way anybody wants to reach you, well, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, every, everybody better go get a pen and paper because they're going to have to write this one down. <laughs> any information you want to know about me can be found at monsters.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's pretty easy to remember. I've had it for 30 years. Smart man. All right. Well, I thank this audience for taking the time to stop by. Please give us that subscribe on YouTube. We drop a new episode every Monday morning. Butch, I thank you again for stopping by. You, get, you bet, my friend. Take care, bud.